Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Plot Lines. I'm your host, Connor. And today we're going to be talking about, in the last uh, year or so, there have been some royal deaths that I'd like to highlight. And I found a few stories to sort of, or a couple of stories to discuss. And I thought you guys would like to hear about it. Uh, also, uh, uh, Sydney from the comments uh, suggested I talk about uh, the death of King Constantine II of Greece. So I thought that it would be a good time to do so. So that's my plan right now. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone uh, who has supported the channel. I, I did a, uh, I thanked a lot of people on Twitter, but I just want to thank all my YouTube subscribers. It's, I really appreciate the fact that you guys watch it. It amazes me that you do. And to be honest, I, I you know, some ways I, I, I don't feel uh, that I'm deserving of it, but that's, uh, that's just me. Uh, but thank you for all for watching. Uh, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you haven't subscribed, obviously, if you have, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, those are the best ways to uh, support the channel. You can also join the Discord, uh, which it, the link should be in the description. Let me know if that link is old. I might have to change. I might have to uh, put a different link. Anyways, that's so. Also, we've hit so we've hit 723 subscribers, which is pretty awesome. I I really appreciate that. Thank you all for doing that. Uh, you know that's just fantastic, and I'm looking forward to hoping to get to uh, a thousand subscribers soon. That would be really awesome. But you know, uh, on to the video topic. So here are the list of 2000 of the deaths in 2022 and 23 so far of de of the royal deaths. I found this on a website so I you know I hope this is accurate. If it's not, someone can let me know if I'm missing anybody or uh, we got the Archduchess Margarita of Austria. Uh, she's also the princess of Savoy o Oosta. Uh, Michaela the Countess of Paris, Prince Karl of Hesse, Prince Rudiger of Saxony, Archduchess, Archduchess Maria Immaculata of Austria, Tuscany, Prince Karl, Duke of Württemberg, Father Florian. This is one of the stories that I'm going to go into more depth. Prince Lotz of Orleans, Bergans. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom. We've already talked about her and her death, and we're, we'll talk a little bit about that, but that's, uh, you know, there's another episode that I've done where I go into her death. Uh, 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 anyways, uh, Max in the chat. Good to see you, Mac. Uh, thanks for the, uh, yeah, the, I wish I could get better lighting, but, you know in the future, but this is what we got. Um, next is, uh, sorry. Next is Maximilian Margrave of, ba of Baden or Baden. Then we have uh, Constantine II, the King of the Hellenes or the King of Greece. So, and then Princess Marie Gabrielle of Luxembourg, the Countess of Holstein. So those are the recent deaths. Uh, we so those are the recent deaths we've got. I want to highlight the uh, the king of the Hellenes, Prince or sorry, King Constantine the second. He is probably the most interesting of these characters. He is a relative of the of the Duke of Edinburgh of uh, Prince Philip who. Prince Philip also died a couple years ago, so he had been very so very close with him. I think they're either cousins or something like that. So he was a reigning monarch, uh, starting in um, in uh, 1964 
when his father's health deteriorated, deteriorated. And so he basically had sort of the, uh, he's one of the last uh, monarchs that truly reigned over his country. And there was, you know, great uh, trouble at the time, a lot of uh, infighting or a lot of fighting between the, the socialists and the monarchists and that sort of thing. And that eventually led to conflict. And there were different moments of republic. There were different moments of dictatorship. There was uh, in- influence by the American government. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was involved in a lot of these things. The Constantine the Second at different points basically tried to restore his throne because his throne was uh was taken away from him as he, after he tried to counter coup make a, do a counter coup against the dictatorship in 1967 so to be honest i mean in this situation do you ra- would, would you rather a dictator or would you rather a king even if you're uh even if you want democracy or if you want a republic i don't think people want a dictatorship that's never i think things have to be really bad for people to want a dictatorship and you know you're really stuck with that dictatorship you could get you know a really terrible man like hitler or you could get you could get somebody uh pretty good like Franco not that he didn't have his faults and that's the thing is when you have a when you have a dictator you are stuck with his faults there's nothing that can mitigate against those faults you are just stuck with it and that and that's very dangerous and that can be very you know disconcerting so Constantine the second he tried to um to get his throne back multiple times uh and so this military junta he at one point worked with them a little bit at one point uh tried to you know uh he tried to, he tried to get them overthrown that didn't work eventually it was uh overthrown the that government was overthrown and uh, his uh, a former prime minister came back and became prime minister once again, Constantinos Karamilis. Sorry, if, sorry for the bad pronunciations. I imagine I'm I don't speak Greek, but that's sort of that's sort of what's going on in this sort of in this situation. Now there was a uh, there was a referendum if they wanted to be a, a kingdom again, and he lost that by uh, a lot. It was uh, 30% voted for a monarchy, but uh, alas, that uh, didn't work out. And he's basically, um, you know, tried to reclaim, uh, or he tried to reclaim property, his own property, uh, so and that's been that had conflicts he died in uh he died january 6th in athens greece and that's kind of interesting just that he was he was able to go back to greece <laughs> it's all, uh so he was able to move back to greece he lived the last couple of uh days in greece and that's and that's kind of beautiful in some ways, you know, returning home. He was able to return home. He lived a lot abroad. Uh, he lived in England for a good amount of time. As I said, he was his family with the Duke of Edinburgh. They would go shooting and that sort of thing. So or they would go hunting and and he would, you know, so they were of a similar mindset. I, you know, we hearken back to a little bit of the fact that the Duke uh, Duke Philip the, or Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, was a very traditional man. There's rumors that he became Greek Orthodox again after uh, the Anglican Church allowed the ordination of women 
it seems that Constantine II, though I imagine he had many faults, was trying to maintain the tradition of his country. Again, he was uh, Greek Orthodox, so he he wasn't a Roman Catholic, but he was trying to maintain the tradition of his country. There was there's interesting aspects there that a lot of it was connected with. Um, you know, he he wanted to emphasize the connection between the kingdom of the Hellenes with the Byzantine Empire and that sort of thing, which is kind of cool, which it really is. It's, you know, that there is a connection there, though, I think very small one. If, if anything, it's a sort of spiritual successor, not a uh, literal successor, though it is the maintaining of sort of that Greek, that Greek heritage. Plus, his name was Constantine. The last emperor of the Byzantine Empire was also named Constantine the first. Uh, I mean, also the creation of the Byzantine Empire in some sense was, in, though it wouldn't have been named this or anything like that, because the Byzantine Empire was ma- named mostly for uh, after, you know, named Byz- the Byzantine Empire uh, by by people post its existence or in the West because they wanted to maintain that the Holy Roman Empire was the successor to the Roman Empire and that sort of thing, that the West was maintained by the Holy Roman Empire and the East was maintained by the Byzantine Empire and that and that sort of thing. And in some ways, you can see how that makes sense, how, how those connect well, and you can see how those are connected. Anyways, so he, he is definitely... King Constantine the second is uh, is an interesting uh, character. He is it, it's interesting how his connection to the British royal family. He is the godfather to Prince William, so the future king of England or king of England, king of Scotland, king of Northern Ireland, the United Kingdom. I'm always interchanging all those things because I'm, I'm because being American, you're just kind of uh, you're you're stuck uh, going through all the different uh, kingdoms. Uh, if 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 it was all up to me, there wouldn't have been a United Kingdom. It would just be uh, the kingdoms of Scotland, Ireland, and uh, England all separated as the Jacobites would have liked. But anyway, so this was a big death that came up in uh, royal circles recently. And I think it's so, I think it hits because there's a lot of, a lot of Orthodox people in the West nowadays. There's a lot of Eastern Christians that live in the West, obviously not, not super substantial. And with the sort of the revival of monarchy being, the sort of being brought up in many conversations these days, there's definitely a, a more of a revival maybe, or it's just intellectuals or people who want to be intellectuals uh, coming to the understanding of the three good versions of government. You have monarchy, uh, you have, uh, you have aristocracy and you have uh, Republic. You don't, democracy is a bad version of that of, of government so and people are getting so tired and fed up with all their different governments these days that that's just how that's that's people's reactions people don't want to deal with politicians people don't want to deal with the you know people who want who do everything they can to gr- gain power power is what these politicians seek and you know they want to they're they're quite dumb these days. They used to be, I think, quite smart. They used to try and hide who they were, and they used to want you not to not to know them very well. But now they can't hide it. They're quite, you know, you know. In the United States, you have Biden, who's basically a puppet. Uh, he's inc- you know, he's lost his mind in a lot of ways, geriatric, and uh, and his wife Jill is just kind of shoving him into that and nope it doesn't in you know she doesn't care she doesn't care what happens to him doesn't care what happens to the nation she just she's wants power kamal harris is just 
you know, using that situation as best she can, but she's, she's, you know, she slept her way up to a uh, high office basically. So, I mean, there's, there's that anyways. So I think monarchy Royals are getting more attention these days from at least Americans and maybe others as well, because politicians are, are such a failure. And it's pretty obvious. Uh, Blessed Emperor Charles is really hitting hard. You know, really, uh, people are really getting acquainted with him because his job was, and the Habsburg monarchy's job was to help protect their peoples from from their politicians. So, and that's and that seems what uh, King uh, Constantine II kind of represents, and that's dying. Or at least he he died so that in that way that sort of shocks people or you know I mean he was 82 so it wasn't a a dramatic death he wasn't young he died at a old age he had a long life and to be honest it's amazing that he didn't get killed or that he didn't die in some uh, some attack by communists or anything like that uh, though it does it's interesting that he was active kind of like Blessed Charles where Blessed Charles tried to retake the throne multiple times and that's kind of what i see in constantine the second i don't know if he was a great ruler you know it's hard for me to kind of uh to get that especially i would need i would need to go into much more uh uh research and uh maybe i will one day and i'll go sort of do a do a biography or do a video explaining fully his life but this is just why i think that it's a big deal that he died and that, you know, how you might uh, look at his legacy, at least from a, or get a glimpse of his legacy. And then I thought this story, so Father Florian, also known as Franz uh, Joseph Michael Maria Ignatius, Prince of Bavaria. He It's really interesting that he was, you know, he's born of, he's a prince of Bavaria. His great, great grandfather was uh, King Ludwig Ludwig III of Bavaria. Uh, And he eventually became a Benedictine novice. And then he also became a, uh, he became uh, a Benedictine priest, so he became a monk, he became a priest, and he served the people of Uganda. Not Uganda, sorry, that's wrong. Maybe it is Uganda, hold on. Um, no, Ethiopia, sorry. Or Kenya, Kenya, I guess, sorry, my bad. He served in Kenya, he was a prior administrator and he was so he was serving these people uh in Africa as a you know as a missionary which is pretty impressive stuff i just love that he you know he devoted his life to being a, de- a dominic or sorry benedictine monk and i i just wanted to point out that this story is something that you don't hear a lot and you see that devotion um, that royals have can have a devotion to not just their state in life, but also uh, be called to a, a greater state in life. The state in life of a monk is very important, and it reminds me a little bit of Cardinal uh, Cardinal Duke of York. He was one of the last uh, Stuart. I think he was the last Stuart claimant to the throne of England, Scotland, and Ireland. He, you know, he, he sort of, he dedicated his life to the church. He was instrumental in the elections of popes and that sort of thing. So he's this, uh, you know, influential cardinal. And this Father Florian, he devoted his life to God in a different way in a much simpler way he so and he uh he died 
June 22nd, 2022. Anyways, he was uh help he was ministering to these uh to this tribe that was semi nomadic. So he was he was going around with them. And that sort of dedication and devotion is something really impressive. And I hope we can take from that and learn uh learn from that. And sort of grow and thank you mac for uh telling everyone to like this episode please subscribe uh support this channel and really it's just kind of these imp- these impressive lives that we don't get to hear about we don't get to hear about this benedictine monk who uh served his uh people or not his people but served other people in Africa, when he started in Bavaria, he started in Germany. He was a prince. He could have lived a, you know, he, at least he might have been able to live a better life, or a, not a better life, but a sort of a more comfortable life. He, you know, instead went out and did, you know, something sa- self-sacrificial. He sacrificed, you know, himself to these uh, these African peoples who he ministered to and it seems from pictures i saw it seems that he's you know very he had a great relationship with the people there and you know administered to them as best he could and you know i you know there's a lot of problems in the priesthood these days i don't i can't really say to what you know his uh you know how good of a priest he was necessarily but there's, you know, at least in, you know, if you're a monk who's out there administering to these Africans, you're at least showing that you want to help people come to the faith. And to me, that's a pretty great, a pretty great uh, showing, you know, you, if they could, you know, you could just uh, not really care, you could just want to live in a luxurious situation and you know there are maybe some benedictines that do that and that's a problem and that's you know one of the things that can become a problem in uh, communities in monasteries where they basically are living uh, very easy lives and benedictines aren't supposed to be living easy lives they're supposed to be you know oral at labor they're supposed to be working and praying and you kind of that's kind of all there is especially if you're probably a benedictine in africa if you're with these tribes that aren't necessarily you know as civilized as um as european civilization and that sort of thing so there's that you know it's that's kind of that's pretty impressive i think he's he's somebody that uh hopefully we might learn uh we may get to maybe hear more stories in the future um so yeah i mean he uh he so the way he one of the reasons he got to became he became a priest is that he went to uh um he went to a uh sort of a benedict the 16th visited and he got to hear a speech by or by benedict the 16th uh or, and then he met his bishop, and after a two-hour uh, conversation with his bishop, he was so joyful and so excited for the possibility of becoming a priest. And that's just, you know, that's so glorious. But really, just, uh, you know, people think of royals as being uh, these people who basically uh, have everything and are snobbish, snobbish and snobbish and think they're above everyone else and that sort of thing but it's nice to see you know you know i'm trying to show you guys a a story of someone who isn't that way uh, uh, is extremely not that way there are i i wouldn't say that i wouldn't say there are many royals that are like that i mean they're uh, at least good catholic ones if you're looking at good catholic royals i think they're more self-sacrificial than you might expect but you know, it, uh, I understand why people 
get that because you look at say Megan and Harry and that sort of thing and you're repulsed by that and I understand that's uh, they are they are full of themselves and they uh, you know they want privacy but they but they're they're telling you they're walking all over the place they're going to different events and they're you know making movie making documentaries about themselves and that sort of thing and they're saying look at me look at me and look uh, you know I want privacy <sighs> There's no way that's uh, how that works, and uh, they don't want privacy. That's pretty clear. Anyway, so I think I hope that uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you want me to do more of these, like keep you updated on uh, what, on sort of these kinds of stories, you know, if I find more stories about royals that are you know important for us to understand, and you know, sort of. And might interest you guys, please let me know if you want more of this. Uh, thank you all for watching. If you started the episode late, please go back and listen to um, or watch the rest of the episode. Uh, Mac wants me to do a, a video on Prince Andrew. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. I, I don't, let, I'll, that might be something I might look into. At least people are talking about that and that sort of thing. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mac, for being in the chat. Uh, for all of you listening, uh, uh, Lou, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, I will keep you guys, uh, you know, uh, informed on this sort of thing. And uh, thank you. Ha uh, please again, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and have a blessed Saturday. Thank you. This is kind of a weird day for me to do this, so uh, I didn't do a live stream earlier this week, so this is me making up for that, so thank you. And uh, let everyone know that uh, this episode's up. Bye, everyone.